everybody. Welcome to Mental Health Matters. This is Tom Duff with St. Louis Counseling, licensed clinical social worker to the stars, as I say. But really, I'm the executive director. And um, we, if you are interested in our services, check us out at stlouiscounseling.org. We have many different services on eight different locations, uh, and we are busy right now in this crazy COVID world. So don't be afraid to check us out. Also, mental health matters, right? We constantly are bringing on intriguing guests, and uh, today is no exception. I'm excited to have Vinton Blandon on with, um, well, formerly of KMOV, right? So I'm, I'm kind of getting you back into the St. Right. Louis airwaves, even though it's the podcast airwaves. But okay. uh, welcome. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thanks for uh, having me on. It's an honor to be here and uh, get back in the field of things that I've done for more than two decades. Yeah, yeah. So you recently had a job change. So now you're a communications director at the Department of Justice, correct? Yeah, that's right. I'm working here at the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of Missouri, uh, basically handling everything TV, radio, digital, and print for U.S. Attorney Jeff Jensen. Day three, so it's cool so far. <laughs> Day three, uh, you're you're taking care of Ben, so you're kind of like a one-stop shop in some regards, huh? Yeah, Never that's pretty all. much what he says. You see the emails, is like, yeah, you're going to be the guy for dot, dot, dot. <laughs> <laughs> nice, cool. nice. Well, yeah, Chris, uh, Chris Denman of Midcoast Media kind of introduced us, and we thought you'd be a great guest because um, one of the things we do at uh, Mental Health Matters on this podcast is we try to make mental health um, okay to talk about. And uh, mental health, we look at as everybody has it. And so a lot of people are like, no, I don't have mental health. You know, I'm, I don't have all those words we use to stigmatize mental health, but we look at it as everyone has physical health and everybody has mental health. And, um, you know, you have a, a interesting story uh, from, from your career. You know, you got, we've had several different careers if you look at it from that <laughs> standpoint, but but yeah. first, you know, I was looking at your bio, right? I saw you grew up in Chicago. So uh, I'm a I'm a, sh a south of Chicago kind of guy myself. But if you had to choose a baseball team, are you Sox or Cubs? Okay, those two, I'm uh, absolutely Sox. <laughs> oh, well, I'm a Cub guy. But um, that's okay. I mean, I, that's okay. I'm both. But, you know, uh, I've gone to more Sox games than the Cubs. But, yeah, so uh -huh. my heart goes to the Sox, but I love the Cubs, you know. Gotcha, gotcha. That's okay. That's okay. We'll hold that against you. But probably in St. Louis, you had a root for the Cardinals or something, didn't you? Right, right. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I don't, though. I don't. I draw the line. <laughs> I definitely right. draw the line. So, uh, so um, I guess first, like, when when did you realize um, you wanted a career in uh, broadcast, um, in journalism? <laughs> I get so that cool. question all the time. Um, I really, uh, my family says I started pretending to be a reporter when I was four or five years old, maybe five or six, can't really remember, but it was down in that uh, deep age so long ago. But uh, the move that got me really interested when I could really think for myself and understand what I was thinking was um, probably in 92. Uh, there were five people killed in my neighborhood. I grew up on the west side of Chicago near uh, Garfield Humboldt Park, if anybody's uh, okay. listening and is familiar with that. That's um, where five people were shot at least I know five people were dead. I can't remember the details of who shot, who's dead. But um, when that happened, uh, a truck showed up with the Channel 5 and a peacock on it. And I said, like, oh, my God, that's Channel 5, NBC. And I uh, noticed Jackie Bain. She's a reporter. She uh, reported the story live. So she was knocking on the door, something that I would do several years later for decades. Hey, how are you? I'm Vincent Bland and blah, 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 you know. So she did that and I knocked on the door. I was fascinated because I saw that person who I had watched on TV for so long. And she's like, hi, uh, are your mom and dad available? And I said, hold on. I think I yelled whatever, but I ended up outside next to the truck as uh -huh. Jackie was still on the porch talking to my people. And I'm just tinkering around looking in the truck. I see a bunch of small TVs. I thought there were about 50 or 60 of them. Now that I've worked in the industry for decades, I realize, oh, there were only two tiny TVs and a lot of buttons. So that's kind of gotten the bug into me. I took a tour of NBC Chicago, went down every day, 
started popping up off the trains going down. My family's looking for me before Amber Alerts, before they really freaked out. Like, uh-huh. I guess he'll be home at some point. But I was downtown at NBC watching the lines for Jenny Jones, if your listeners are remembering that. Yeah. During Springer, I used to see them. And I was fascinated uh-huh. to see those talk show hosts. I thought that was legendary. So I went yeah. from there, and I just stuck around the newsroom. And boom, wow. boom, boom, from 92 to 2020. <laughs> Wow. Amazing. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So you were hopping on the L and just going to the hangout. Yeah. Yeah. That was the <laughs> coolest thing. I, my family would really look for me and uh-huh. I would tell somebody, so they're like, he's downtown. Now it was only probably a, maybe a 15 minute ride downtown on the train. So uh-huh. it was cool. Amazing. Amazing. So you made it a career, huh? But you had a little stint in the military, right? Yeah. So I left Chicago at the early age, um, I think it was 12 at that time, I went to high school uh, in South Carolina. My family said, hey, you got to get out of the city if you want to do this TV thing, be something, blah, blah, blah. So I went to high school in Traveler's Rest, South Carolina, that's about 20 miles outside of Greenville in the upstate for people who might be listening and knowing that. Um, I did high school, sort of tinkered with TV a little bit on the side, making $75 a week on a hard paper check, couldn't even cash it, I didn't have an account, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. So um, did that, eventually went into the Marine Corps from senior year of high school. So I went overseas, stationed in Japan, went to the Philippines, Korea, Thailand, Australia, came back, positioned at Quantico. And I got back in television by being at Quantico just outside DC. And I took an internship, they were like, wow, you really know this stuff. How do you know this? I guess they thought I was some crazy Marine just going to community college. Trying to figure exactly, it out. Yeah. I said, oh, I was at WYFF in Greenville, South Carolina. 505 Rutherford Road. Oh, wow, you know what you're doing. So it went from there. I think about two months into that internship, I uh, had a part-time job, that got real money, and it went from there. So I was off air a while, an assignment editor. And then 2004, I went from D.C. to Baltimore, Started reporting in 04 in Charlottesville, Virginia, Charleston, South Carolina, Huntsville, Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama, St. Louis, Missouri. Wow. So that's the reporting career. Wow. Wow. So over so over that time, I mean, you've covered so many, you know, great stories, I imagine, but at the same mm-hmm. time, so many tragic stories as well, too. And I know sometimes, you know, when I'm watching the news and, I, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, night after night, day after day, newscast after newscast, you know, these reporters are are just surrounded by trauma, grief, um, despair. You know, how how do you manage to to monitor your own emotional health, you know, from day to day? I think it changes. But for me personally, this is just literally what I do. And I even do it now in this new job on day three. Um, I get up. I'll start from early in the morning. I'm still a military clock guy i can wake up no matter what time i need to by alarm without an alarm if i know i have to be up at six i tend to wake up about 5 40. if i have to be up at nine i'll sleep about 8 30. Uh, but i start with music sometimes i just kind of get up sit up on the bed like really just sit up on it lean against the headboard Uh, i'll listen to some gospel music and i just kind of chill Sometimes when I have a hard day, so backing up a little bit, I'll put on the relaxation music. It's the boring music, but it's relaxing, like all the sounds and things. So I do that to try to help calm my brain down. Um, mm-hmm. So that's kind of what I do. But throughout the day, um, I keep an electronic Bible on my phone. I go to scripture, um, sometimes just read quotes. And I try to put out positive energy because I think in life we get what we put out onto others. So I try to move with positivity 99% of the time. So I'm always just trying to think because I think it's a state of mind, really. It exists, it's real, but I do think sometimes you can get in that sunken place. So if you think positive, you can usually remain positive. Mm-hmm. How do you, you know, when you're, when you're on scene in some of those situations, whether it be I mean, just gun violence, right here in in in, in St. Louis, um, having to see that, um, and in the aftermath of that, right? Um, you know, how do you how do you kind of take care of the the people you're around to, the witnesses and, and the people that you might be interviewing? You know, um, I, I think that's a side that probably the general public don't don't mm-hmm. recognize, but you know, you guys are 
are helpers as well too in a lot of you know you're telling a story but at the same time i can see you guys being helpers in that in that area as well yeah i think it goes depending on who you are depending on what kind of day because i always think that we are advocates as journalists um we're out there talking to people i think i would say i'm helping by getting the story out, by bringing awareness to it, by being a, deter a deterrent. Some people who are victims of violence, who are survivors of victims, they might think, oh, we're vultures. We're out there just attacking and getting story out there to get ratings. It's not about that, at least not for a veteran journalist, typically someone like me. Um, you're usually out there. So when you say help, help can be subjective, but um, Mm -hmm. When I'm talking to people, when I'm knocking on the door, I usually just say, hey, how are you? This is Vincent with News 4. Um, yeah, just wondering, do you, are you interested in talking? I try to not pressure them. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, they know why we're there. They see the news truck. They see me with the microphone and the mic flag on the Santa channel. So they're like, uh-oh, sometimes we don't want to talk. Sometimes they ignore me, but I see them through the blinds. Sometimes they just come on the porch and yell. Sometimes it's an active scene and they're just emotional, cursing, you know. I don't take it personally because I know they're in a vulnerable spot. It's tragic for them. So they are reacting. Sometimes it's like an out-of-body experience. They may not even realize. They're in shock, essentially. So I just try to approach with kindness, compassion, empathy, while also being aggressive, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I try to show some vulnerability in myself. I try to resonate. I try to assimilate to them, uh, especially in the black community. I say, hey, yeah, you know, I grew up on the West Side. I see this stuff all the time, man. It's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. What do you think? You uh, you want to talk? Just tell me about tell me about the good stuff, the memories. I don't need to ask you if you saw the gun, what kind of gun, who was it. You know, let, let police do their thing. Let me get the sound bite from you talking about the emotion. You got a photo. Mm -hmm. So I usually approach it that way, and I think I'm helping. Some mm -hmm. people might say I'm not. I'm just getting a story. Mm -hmm. Definitely, yeah, yeah. No, I, and and I do think it. You know, like journalists. Um, you know, a lot of times I think people can make those assumptions really quick. But until you, until you listen and try to understand what it's all about, you know, and that's right. that's what we always have to do, right? Is slow down. <laughs> And try to hear the other point of view from people. We're, we're known for that. It's such an interesting society within in that regard. You know? right. Now, you know, as a young man that got interested in news um, at an early age, right? An African-American man, like you mentioned, in the, in the community. Um, and just looking at TV, right? Or broadcast news over the years. Um, how hard has that been um, as an African American male to to find your place to be able to to kind of break down some walls as well too as you go? Have you experienced a lot of that over the years? Um, I, I would say it's the, the quick answer: yes. Mm -hmm. uh, how often the frequency of it? Infrequently, some cities, especially when you first get to a city, they're thinking. Oh, this, that, uh, well, yeah, he's just a black guy here making us look bad. Listen, stop, you know, because they think the media is the enemy. They think we're not telling everything we're supposed to. They think we're lying, telling what the police do. So I try to say, look, man, I'm just doing my job. You may work where you work. This is my job. This is my profession. I've been doing it years. I'm a veteran. This is what I do. Let me tell the facts of the story. You don't have to answer everything. Um, some other communities, yeah, sometimes it's just on the way I look compared to the way some others look. Uh, hadn't had that type of racism a lot. A couple of times I do remember. Um, then sometimes it's just I work in a community where I was the first black male reporter, and that was like I must have been a unicorn. People were like, oh, uh -huh. He speaks yeah. so well, or he speaks good. You know, it's like, hmm, that's a little yeah. different. You know, and I'm like, well, you have to speak well on TV. You know, not everyone is the best, but I guess in that community, it was kind of unusual to see someone like me who can get on TV and talk uh, the mm -hmm. best way possible. Mm -hmm. 
So how, yeah, I mean, in, in the field itself, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure over the years now there's more, more individual African-American individuals. Um, but you know, historically there probably has not been, you know, um, if you look at, you know, the, the main networks over the years, you know, it was always three male white anchors, you know, for each of the three main networks and stuff. Um, so over time, I'm sure you've experienced, um, you know, growth in that sense, but probably still a long way to go. Um, I imagine, um, with fighting for those prime time spots, so to speak, or even any spot. Yeah, I would say it, it hits along the lines of any spot, really. Um, I'm a, a co-chair with the National Association of Black Journalists. That's a organization that was founded decades ago, um, and it helped. It uh, was able to help fight. We use the word fight, but it's probably more advocate that people like me will have the opportunity to hold jobs, the network, um, and for St. Louis, I was the vice president for the Greater St. Louis Association of Black Journalists. My term ended uh, earlier this year, and I didn't seek anything else because I was contemplating leaving the business, which I ultimately did. So we did that here, and we do a lot of uh, community events. We talk to groups. We visit the schools. We are always working at the colleges, talking to students, trying to encourage them to be a part of a regional team and go to the national team, we give scholarships, we hold galas. So we're always advocating. Um, I can't really speak, I will say overall in this market, even though it looks like we have a few of us, um, we probably don't have enough. Um, I can speak for my station, I won't get into details because I don't know if that's proprietary now since I'm gone, but uh, we are okay, or they are okay since I'm no longer there. Um, I have the numbers, the details I verify with our corporate office, and there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, KMLB News 4 is doing well in some areas, but it's not where it needs to be or where station management wants it to be. And a uh, misconception that I hear everywhere, I've worked at nine TV stations, oh, we just don't have enough of blacks out there doing this. I wholeheartedly think that's a lie. Uh, I've been doing a lot of diversity and inclusion stuff for years. I can look on my Facebook, I got 4,500 friends. I bet you 100 of them are good enough to get a job somewhere in this country. We have 212 television markets. Some of those markets have four stations in each market. Let's put one in each market if you wanted to. So I just hate the notion that some managers say, oh, we don't have enough. It's probably that way in the medical field clinical field, you know, we don't have enough minorities. So, mm -hmm. so that's another concept when you talk about mental health and you want somebody who looks like you so that you can resonate, so that you can understand, so that you can have those conversations with. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Cause I mean, and that's the thing with, you know, our mental health, our emotional health, what people experience on a daily basis affects the overall you know, well, brain chemistry as well. You know, mm -hmm. when we talk about systematic racism, when we talk about um, trauma, when we talk about all those aspects, when people live that every single day, it affects, science tells us, you know, it affects the way we approach life, the way we look at events, the way we perceive reality as well too. So, so when you, when you, when you mention that, there's so much truth behind that. And, and sometimes, you know, you do hear that answer and that's what it's all about. Sometimes it's challenging the status quo or the usual answer, you know, there's, well, there's just not enough um, uh, individuals of color in this business, you know, and, and, you know, we, we hear that too with, um, with social work and even African-American mm -hmm. males, you know, there's not enough um, African-American males who want to be therapists. Well, then if that's, if that's true, then how do we actually then fix that? You know, how do we and go to schools? Yeah, that's the same thing because uh, in my TV station, I was always trying to be an ambassador, be a leader, be an advocate, be a fighter for diversity and inclusion. I think, oh, we don't have enough. Well, nurture it. I used to tell my boss, and I did, uh, quite frankly, right before I left, I said, how about we reach out to one of our 17 other stations and get the young black lady who's doing the weekend morning show. If you think she has what it takes, go ahead and bring her. Promote her here. Nurture her. Make her the best daggum black producer in the newsroom so that we can get those numbers up, you know? And uh, 
become better in our community so that we can have representation because diversity is so important and not just with uh, the color of the skin because I think it does play mentally because in the room, I'm like, well, I'm vocal. Yeah, nobody here understands. And you know, something about the hair too, you know, we may have concepts about long hair and I bring that up because I'm thinking about changing my hair. And I'm really uh-huh. cautious. I think it's very receptive here. Not many of us on my floor on the executive side, but that may come off the like, oh, his hair is different when that doesn't make me a bad person. It just makes a difference. So that's a mental thing. Um, if you have all of one type of group in your office, you may feel alienated because you don't have someone like you. You don't have someone being your eyes and ears. And I always say diversity comes to black, white, Male, female, country mouse, city mouse, gay, straight, uh, wealthy, low income, somebody who's military, non-military, Republican, Democrat, college, non-traditional. You know, you just have to have a good body of work because, in, at least in my former career, you had to have a different voice. When you read and when you tell stories, you don't want to hear from the same old school of thought. So I think it comes in. And if you don't, that's going to wear down on your mental ability. It may hit your confidence level. It may hit your, um, you know, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, you may become complacent because you know when you're comfortable. comfortable um, when you're comfortable, it can kill you too. The ego. You may feel hurt, challenged, alienated, depressed. It can be a number of things mentally. So, yeah. Well, and and what diversity does for us as well, I think, is something that sometimes we don't don't appreciate when we surround ourselves with different cultures, different viewpoints, different uh, ways of looking at things. Right? What that does mm-hmm. for our our overall well being, our mind, our our own mind. You know, and and the research behind as. You know, when they talk about when people get older, you know, you, you got to mm-hmm. keep doing stuff. Either you get a hobby or you keep working. But the creativity that comes from diversity actually empowers, yeah. you know, the old white guy. Not that I'm old, right? right, right. Um, but um, I'm getting there. But uh, uh, the, the reality is, like, it, it, it's invigorating. You know, it can be a new beginning in that sense. And I think sometimes we forget that um, as well, too. Mm-hmm. I would agree um, with that. Yeah. So, uh, military wise, um, do you miss it? Uh, I do. I miss the camaraderie. I don't miss, you know, the old uh, rigmarole you talk about, the old stuff that you don't want to deal with, that extra stuff, the crap. Um, but I miss the friendships. Uh, like in this office, we have a lot of military people with a few Marines. So I'm like, yes, uh, when I'm out in the community, whether it's at the mall or just around the arch or something, hey, you're a Marine. Yeah, hurrah. You know, we get two minutes <laughs> later, we're all back to normal. <laughs> so that's good uh, every now and again. Uh, which career has been tougher? Um, uh, journalism or uh, the Marine Corps? Hmm. But I would say probably journalism because in the military, you understood your mission. You did it. It was already your mind said, oh, you're not going to complain. You're going to do what the commander says, what the captain says, what the sergeant says. In TV, I think to know, it's like, yeah, I'm going to do that. Yeah, speak out, you know, whatever. No, you know, you get mouthy. You can do that here, but you can't do that in the military. So maybe more mentally stressful in television. Mm-hmm. Wow. Um one, you got somebody who is eager to um, uh, get into the career. What advice would you get uh, give them? And then secondly, to somebody who is just starting out, um, their first year, first, second year, um, just got their first job in, in broadcast, um, what would you tell them to, to help them maintain their mental health? Uh, just self-care. You know, I didn't always do it. I think we know what we know. But it's never enough when it comes to self-care. If it's just, I'm going to go in the office every day for the first 15 minutes, I'm going to sit and just relax. I'm going to do some breathing exercises. It also becomes a little more deeper mentally because you feel, oh, I have to do everything. And I was one of those. I was a workaholic. I'm still a workaholic. 
like I said, I'm on day three of my new job. It is totally different. I mean, <laughs> that's the only reason I relax in the office. I've stayed, you know, to do this. Um, it's totally different. So I would say just make sure you take care of yourself. Write in your journal, you know, uh, write yeah. things out, sing, do something that you like to do, a hobby. Find a good work-life balance. Have a mentor so that you can bounce things off of each other, talk to someone, latch on to an old seasoned vet in the newsroom, be um, able to speak when you have a problem, and have a tough skin. That's the cliche. Have a tough skin, but that is so true. Don't go in and I'm like, oh, no, they're picking on me, or, ew, that's blood. Like, you're yeah. doing is what you think you were going to see. Oh my God, another person shot. It's sad because I think sometimes you can get jaded and I was probably there. I could walk up, see brain matter on the ground and be like, oh, okay. And that's sad because I've seen enough of it that I'm like normal. I've been at plane crashes where it really looks like a potato chip on the ground. And the wow. cop told me many years ago, no, that's the skin. I was like, from what? Oh, when they crash and the body is on fire and the uh, plane is disintegrating some of the skin does fry like a potato chip or fall on the ground it's like oh my gosh you just never know so i think you have to have a tough skin you have to be ready to deal with some stuff because it's going to be gruesome and sometimes you have happy stories but when it comes to mental health yeah you have to expect all of the bad stuff and be prepared for it it sounds like and have that toolkit of uh self-care mm -hmm. strategies that works for you, for that person, for that individual. Mm -hmm. And it can work but, out any kind of way. If you like to sing in the shower, you want to get up early and sing 30 minutes, like long shower sing. If you want to get up and just walk around uh, a park, or if you want to just sit and read, if you want to get up and do yoga. Um, so when I left the station, I, I had always done some things, but I was really trying. I got up and um, every morning and stretched. Probably should have done it anyway, but I just yeah. kind of took the time to relax a little bit and stretch. And that was my knockoff yoga because I have a friend who teaches yoga and uh, he and his wife are always <laughs> doing stuff. Like, you need to come. I was like, yeah. But I said, well, I'm just going to do my free yoga. So I got up and stretched each morning, listened to my music and just kind of relax, uh, turn off the TV. Uh, one thing I started to do, I started listening to I, um, podcasts more. I have not looked at a newscast, local news. I've looked at national since August 15th. And that's wow. a miracle for me. Yeah. But I feel yeah. I need to detox. So I'm doing some self-care now. I'm not rushing home to catch the TV. I'm just relaxing. Beautiful. You know, and the nice part about this is, you know, we got this macho Marine veteran <laughs> news reporter that's talking about, right. like, take care of yourself. It's okay to uh -huh. take care of yourself. And that's, yeah, you have that's, to. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great message. It's a definitely a great message. So, Benton, um, it's been a pleasure having you on. I'm glad you're able to take time out of this week, um, your first week at a brand new job. I know that's never easy. Um, and it's like a whole different culture, I imagine. So, Very. definitely appreciate the time. Uh, it, you're welcome. Have me back anytime to talk about something interesting. That'll work for me. Excellent. Excellent. Now I can brag that I was the first one to get you back on the St. Louis podcast airwaves. There we that go. That is so true. Very much. So, yep. Write it down. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Well, this has been Tom Duff uh, with Mental Health Matters. Uh, check us out at stlouiscounseling.org. Until next time, take care and be good to each other. Bye-bye. All right. This has been Mental Health Matters with Tom Duff of St. Louis Counseling Services. Check out stlouiscounseling.org for more information.